Yeah, please, a lot of applause. All right. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Lee, for that very kind introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Chairman Lee and yourself and the rest of the organising committee for the uh, very kind invitation to participate in this 40th anniversary event for SCL and to uh, congratulate you on remarkable achievement, achievements over the last 40 years. Uh, it was not until I came to the meeting that I realised the uh, key role that SCL had played in the COVID-19 pandemic in, uh, in, in Korea. And uh, this story certainly resonates with me because in my own lab, uh, I have largely had to put our microbiome research on hold for three years while we ran over one million COVID tests at UC San Diego in a uh, new clinical infrastructure there, as well as setting up a wastewater program and a vending machine system so that we could integrate the environmental and the clinical. And uh, that has really given, given me a, an appreciation that I did not have before uh, about the gap between what we can do for research in the microbiome versus what will be needed to uh, achieve, uh, achieve a valuable clinical diagnostic. Uh, I've also very much appreciated um, both the connections to new people here in the symposium who I had not met before, as well as wonderful colleagues like Professor Li Ping Zhao, who will be speaking later in the session, who it is a true, uh, a true pleasure to see again after, uh, after four years uh, in the pandemic. So, uh, so very frequently I give rather futuristic talks about what the potential of the microbiome is going to be. And especially with a topic like uh, the microbiome and AI, uh, there, is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of exciting research happening that is on the cusp of being valuable, but is not valuable yet. So what I chose to talk to you about today is a more restrictive but more realistic view of what we are doing in the microbiome right now uh, and its role in uh, diagnostics for cancer microbiome. And so uh, the technology that I'm going to talk about today has received breakthrough designation from the FDA. It is not yet on the market as a test, as a diagnostic test for cancer, but we hope that it will be very soon. And so what you are seeing is uh, near future rather than far future for what the microbiome has to offer. And this is very much informed by our experience of having to take a research assay and turn it into a real clinical test for SARS-CoV-2 during the pandemic. Uh, I do have some disclosures. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, work that we are commercializing through Micronoma, uh, a company that I co-founded in uh, 2020. Um, I have a number of other disclosures, although they are not relevant to this talk. So uh, my lab has been engaged in technology for the microbiome uh, for, uh, for, for, the last, um, for the last 20 years now. And back in 2008, we introduced a technique that doubled the number of the 16S ribosomal RNA sequences, the name tags that we use out to read bacteria for complex specimen that were available as the total sum of scientific knowledge about microbial communities. And uh, in this paper, we introduced the idea that is now pretty standard, but then was revolutionary, uh, barcoding each of many different samples and then mixing them together and sequencing them on a single high throughput sequencing run. And so in the study, we were able to overnight collect half a million 16S ribosomal RNA sequences from a whole range of different environments including the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients. So uh, right at the beginning of this, doing a, clinical, uh, doing, a, doing a clinically relevant setting. We looked at rivers across North America to assess microbes involved in pollution. We looked at microbes in the air, an incredibly challenging and low biomass environment that has also been incredibly important during the COVID-19 pandemic to understand what microbes, including viruses, we are breathing in right now. And uh, finally, we were able to uh, sample microbes from the Guerrero Negro microbial mat, the most complex microbiome that we know of on Earth, with entire phyla of microbes that have still been observed nowhere else. And when we took these hundreds of samples and uh, we sequenced them together and organized the data using a distance metric uh, developed by Kathy Lozapone and, and myself called Unifrac, what you can see is perfect clustering of the samples according to what type of environment that, we came for, that they came from. And we could also get a lot of detailed information about what was going on within each of these environments. 
But what was most remarkable about this is that those half million sequences we collected, at the time, the Sanger facility down the hall from my lab was still charging $8 for every sequence. So if we had done the study using the old technology, it would have cost $4 million and it would, it would have taken about a decade to do the sequencing. Whereas we reduced that to just $12,000 and we did the sequencing overnight. So this is a technology that enabled the Human Microbiome Project, uh, the Earth Microbiome Project, and many other large-scale sequencing efforts to understand the microbes that are in different communities by multiplexing hundreds or even thousands of samples together on a single sequencing run. But to me, what is most remarkable is that this amount of sequencing that cost $4 million in 2008 cost $12,000, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, $4 million in 2007, cost $12,000 in 2008. Today, when we do it on the latest Illumina technology at our facility at UC San Diego, it costs us just 75 cents. And this is remarkable, right, because uh, if it's going to cost you $4 million a sample, you're probably not going to run many samples. But if it's going to cost you less than a buck, that's where, you, that's where you can start about thinking about sequencing whole populations, uh, doing time series, doing large spatially explicit study designs, and uh, getting it into uh, low resource settings, not just in the richest countries. So uh, when we think about what it makes up our bodies uh, at the level of cells, the importance of understanding the microbiome becomes clear because each of us, according to the latest estimates, has about 30 trillion human cells in our bodies. But we have about 39 trillion microbial cells, most of them bacteria in the gut, or they were scattering on the skin, in the mouth, and in other habitats. And so that's where this idea that we might just be 43% human comes from. However, it becomes more remarkable when we think about it at the DNA level. And uh, so let's think about that for a moment. Each of us has about 20,000 human genes, as revealed by the Human Genome Project. And we've heard a number of wonderful talks today about the importance of taking those human genes into account when we're doing diagnostics for cancer, for cardiovascular disease, for a whole range of other complex traits. But what is amazing is that the Human Microbiome Project, MetaHIT, various other large-scale sequencing projects looking at metagenomics, have revealed that the size of our microbial gene catalog is somewhere like 2 to 20 million microbial genes. And so that's amazing, right? Because if we think about the number of unique genes that are associated with our body, fewer than 1% of those are the ones that are in the human genome. And uh, each of us is going to be at least 99% identical in our human genome to the person we're sitting next to, whether, uh, whether you're from the same country or whether you're sitting next to one of the international participants at the symposium. But your microbes can be 80 or 90% different. Almost all of them are different from one another, even if you are both from the same country. So there's a lot of excitement at the moment about using genetic data to do systems biology, systems medicine even. But it is difficult to do systems anything if you are ignoring 99% of that system, as we do when we focus only on our human genes. But what is most remarkable to me and most inspiring and uh, as you are going to hear from Professor Zhao soon, such a key opportunity is that the 99% of our genes we ignore when we focus on the human ones are the 99% that we can change. So rather than being fixed at conception, these microbial genes change throughout our process of development, continue to change throughout our adult lifetime. And if we can take control over that process of change in these microbial genes, we can set ourselves up for dramatically improved health over that lifetime. So uh, when we think of cancer, uh, we very frequently think of the human genome, uh, we think of the cancer genome, and we typically think of cancer as a sterile entity. And uh, Greg Poor, uh, a very talented MD-PhD student who graduated from my lab recently, was fascinated by this concept of the hallmarks of cancer, uh, where the uh, classic papers describing the hallmarks of cancer have been cited over 100,000 times. But these papers don't mention microbes and cancer at all. They go through all the different features of tumors, of cancer cells, of physiological processes, but microbes are entirely neglected. And uh, unfortunately, what got Greg interested in medical research was a story similar to the stories that I'm sure have got many of you interested in medical research as well. 
Um, so this, uh, th this is Greg's grandmother, um, uh, uh, photographed around 2011 and uh, providing Greg's personal motivation for studying the cancer microbiome. And uh, unfortunately, relatively soon after this photo was taken, where she was doing fine, uh, attending professional sports matches and so on, um, uh, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And uh, unfortunately, uh, with, within a couple of months of that event, uh, his grandmother was gone. And uh, this, is what inspired, uh, this is what inspired Greg to go to, uh, to medical school and enter a highly competitive MD-PhD program. And he was fascinated with this idea that despite the genomic revolution and all of the progress that we've made in identifying human genes that are linked to pancreatic cancer and uh, genetic changes that happen within the tumor itself, uh, the improvement for pancreatic cancer survival had not changed all that much since the 1970s, despite the genomic revolution and despite all of this promise of the genome. So um, at, at, about the same, uh, at about the time that uh, Greg was choosing a lab to join in 2017, uh, a remarkable paper from Ravid Strassman's lab, and Ravid will feature uh, later in this talk, uh, came out in science. And Ravid was able to show that if you look at pancreatic tumors, 76% of the pancreatic tumors were colonized with bacteria, and certainly at a much higher rate, as you can see in, the, in these graphs, than uh, what you see in a DNA-free control or an organ donor pancreas. And one wonderful thing about Ravid's work is how uh, careful uh, it is, both in terms of molecular and bioinformatics controls, and how rigorous it is in excluding sources of contamination that are otherwise a major problem when you want to look at tumors associated with, uh, sorry, when you want to look at microbes associated with surgically collected samples. So uh, on the basis of this result, uh, Greg was fascinated with the idea, uh, how could microbes colonize every corner of our planet, as we documented in the Earth Microbiome Project, everywhere from the upper atmosphere uh, to deep below the ocean floor, and yet somehow uh, be completely excluded from the, tumor, uh, from the tumors within our microbe-covered bodies? That just didn't make any sense to Greg, and so he thought, how can I look in a systematic way, not just at one tumor type, but at all the tumor types that are available for microbial signatures that might be making a difference? Uh, so Greg performed the largest scale proof of concept that cancer is not sterile uh, using TCGA, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which is a giant project that was, uh, that, that was supported by um, NIH and other international funding agencies. And uh, to do this project, Greg had to sift through two and a half petabytes of data uh, covering 33 different tumor types from 11,000 patients. And uh, this was published in Nature uh, in 2020, unfortunately in March of 2020 when the world had its mind on other things. And so uh, we are now starting to see that distraction uh, from the COVID pandemic starting to wane where we can get back to, uh, to the microbiome research that we usually do. And, um, and, so, uh, and so, so Greg and uh, his collaborators, including Jenya Koplova, uh, another uh, very talented postdoc in my lab at the time, uh, put together a workflow to analyze all of the, the entire TCGA database in the cloud. And so to do this, what we did is we threw away all of the human reads, which is normally why you do the tumor sequencing in the first place. Uh, and then we did taxonomy assignment on the remaining reads. Uh, and then this is very important, we did batch correction and decontamination using machine learning methods. And I'll uh, come back to the importance of that in a, in, a, in a moment. But then what we were able to do was to take all those microbial abundances in each one of those samples and uh, look at the clinical metadata and apply machine learning to figure out what were the signatures uh, of microbes in each tumor where they existed. And then the other piece of this is that we put together a, a comprehensive cancer microbiome atlas where if you're interested in seeing what the microbes in each of these tumor types are or their signatures, for example, to uh, develop a more targeted assay, uh, for example, using qPCR or microarrays uh, rather than next-gen sequencing, uh, we, made that, we made that atlas uh, completely and freely available so that anyone could reproduce the results and go and look at the signatures for themselves. Now, I should point out that Greg was not the first person to think, wouldn't it be cool if there were microbes and tumors and in the TCGA data? And uh, when Greg got his initial results and plotted them, he was very disappointed for the reason that I think a lot of other people have also been disappointed and have given up on this type of analysis. 
So what you can see here is, so each dot on this graph represents a particular sample, and you can see very clear clusters in that graph. But the clusters have nothing to do with the characteristics of the people and nothing to do with the characteristics of the tumors. What you're seeing here is clustering by which sequencing center did the sequencing analysis. And this is absolutely typical of low biomass microbiome analyses. There are many sources of error and contamination, and uh, the technical variation can be much greater than the biological variation that you hope to see. So, um, so fortunately, uh, Greg persisted where many people had given up at this step, where there's the documentation of very considerable biases based on what sequencing center did the work. And uh, he applied to machine learning techniques from the human gene expression field, SNM and VOOM, where taken together, uh, these techniques are able to batch correct the data. And so what you can see is that after batch correction on the right, all of those per sequencing center clusters go away and all of the data are harmonized into the same data frame. So even in the face of this very extensive contamination, uh, we are able to eliminate that effect and see what is, this, uh, what is the biological signal that's left behind. So uh, I just want to reinforce the importance of these corrections for technical variation in TCGA, because although it's true that for the microbiome, uh, just as you have heard for a number of other tests uh, during this wonderful symposium, there is a lot of variability between different labs in how they do the assessment, um, you can correct for that technical variation if you have enough data, and if that data is matched enough between the different methods that are applied. And so uh, what we are looking at here um, is, the, uh, is, is the implication for the biological variables and for the technical variables of the batch correction using principal variance components analysis uh, to, um, to, to analyze how much each of these factors contributes to the overall microbiome results. And so uh, what, what you see in particular is that for the biological variables, uh, they are boosted substantially after we do this batch correction uh, from five to 17 fold. And what you see is that the technical uh, variables such as the sequencing center, uh, the sequencing platform and the experimental strategy, whether they're sequencing DNA or RNA, all of those variables are decreased dramatically from eight to 20 fold. And so uh, after doing this batch correction, what we see is that disease type explains more signal than anything else in the data. So then the question is, can we even distinguish the cancer types based on the unique microbiome in each of the cancer tissues? Um, so, what we, uh, so, so what we applied is uh, machine, um, m machine learning methods, very similar to what you saw from Professor Choi, uh, where we are primarily using random forest classifiers. Uh, we have also used things like, uh, like boosted decision trees. And these are, very uh, these are very powerful and very flexible machine learning methods that we have been using in the microbiome since 2011, when my uh, graduate student at the time, Dan Knights, who is now a professor at the University of Minnesota, uh, introduced these machine learning technologies to the microbiome field. And uh, the most important thing to look at here is the, um, is the top row where we're looking at the classifier accuracy of one cancer type versus all others, where we're looking at the area under the rock curve, and if it's above 0.8, which is pretty good classifier accuracy, then it is an orange, and if it is above 0.95, which is excellent classifier accuracy, uh, then it is in red. In panels B and panels C, you can see that for some of the tumor types where we have good enough data to run the comparisons, we are also able to distinguish the primary tumor versus solid tissue normal based on these bacterial signatures. And one thing that is especially exciting is that for a few kinds of cancer, uh, we can separate stage one versus stage four tumors, although there is not that much data in TCGA that allows us to address that question directly. Uh, it is something that we are very interested in, especially for the possibility uh, that you might be able to take a very small biopsy and figure out what stage of tumor it came from based on the microbial succession, the ecological pattern that happens within each of those tumors as time progresses. Uh, I want to give you some examples of what the curves look like that are summarized by, the, by these data. And uh, again, in Professor Choi's talk, uh, you saw some, um, uh, you, you saw some, uh, some uh, rock curves and some precision recall curves. And uh, just to describe, uh, just to describe what, what these are, and I'm taking a risk with the pointer, which does not work. Uh, the laser pointer is too dim for this very bright screen. 
Um, so in, in, the first, in the first panel, panel D, what we are looking at is a very nice, um, uh, we are looking at a very nice rock or receiver operator characteristics curve, where on the x-axis you see the false positive rate, and on the y-axis you see the sensitivity. And if you, have a, uh, if you have a diagonal straight line, that is what random chance gives you, uh, where basically, uh, basically for every false positive you incorporate another true positive. And what you want is a very steep curve that gives you an area close to one, where it climbs very steeply and flattens out. And so, um, and, and so uh, then the precision recall curve is plotting recall on the x-axis versus precision on the y-axis. For those curves, we also care about the area under the curve, where the closer it is to one, the better you are able to, um, the, the, the better you are able to uh, correctly diagnose all the true positives while avoiding, um, while avoiding also all the false positives and false negatives. And so for those curves, what you want is you want a pattern where they go uh, along the top all the way to the right-hand side, and then they decline very steeply. And so uh, you can see in both of these examples from the uh, top line of the graph, both the receiver operator characteristics curve and the precision recall curve uh, have areas very close to one and have excellent diagnostic capability. And this is really important if you want to not just see differences between groups in the microbiome, but to be able to use the microbiome for an individual diagnostic test where you can tell for one individual uh, what it is that they have. So, uh, so we thought this was pretty cool, uh, being able to assess in a sample of uh, a tumor tissue uh, what type of tumor it was based on, based on the microbial DNA. But uh, Greg was a little concerned uh, about, uh, about whether this was too good to be true. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to look at the blood samples as a control. Because one thing they do in TCGA is they sequence the DNA of the tumor but then they also sequence the DNA of the blood to tell you what the person's normal genome looks like without any cancer. And so Greg reasoned, if there are microbes specifically in the tumor, then they should not be in the blood, right? So what should happen is you should be able to see microbes that are inside the tumor itself, but if you look at the blood, it should be sterile because the accepted wisdom is that blood is sterile. So Greg did that analysis, and he was very, uh, very upset initially to find that the microbial profiles of the tumor, the kinds of microbes that were relatively common across different tumor types and within each tumor, uh, were very similar to the, microbe uh, the, the microbes that he saw in the blood. And he thought that all of his stringent attempts to decontaminate the data had not gone far enough, and we were still seeing contamination from the kits or from the sequencing center or from some other source that affected the blood as well as affecting, uh, as well as affecting the tumor tissue. And I told him, well, Greg, don't give up too soon because there are two things that are really exciting about this. The first is, who says that blood is sterile? Your entire thesis project is premised on the idea that the tumors are not sterile, so maybe the blood is not sterile either. And second, if it's really true that uh, there are microbes in the blood, but where those microbes come from is they come from the tumor, just like cell-free DNA uh, that you can use as a diagnostic comes from the tumor, then maybe there really are microbes in the blood of each patient that come from that patient's tumor. And if that's true, you should be able to do the same classification task on microbes in the blood that you do on microbes in the tumor, and the results should be just as good. So Greg agreed to run that analysis, and what he found was astonishing, because what he found was that the blood-borne microbial DNA was just as predictive of cancer type uh, even after, uh, as, as, the tumor, as the tumor microbial DNA. And this performance remained very strong even after extremely stringent decontamination efforts, uh, keeping only the handful of taxa that were most frequently, uh, most frequently found in the tumors, most prevalent as well as most abundant, and removing all of the microbes that had ever been traced back to kit contamination. And so what, what you can see here is an example of uh, colon adenocarcinoma, where we have excellent performance both on the rock curve and on the precision recall curve. And then for the cutaneous melanoma, we got the worst performance, but the area under the rock curve was still, uh, was, was still nearly 0.9, which is still very respectable performance and useful for diagnosis. Although the area under the precision recall curve was not so good, uh, in part due to limitations in the samples that were available. But the, uh, uh, the confusion matrices were still extremely encouraging. So what was really exciting about this is it suggested that to use this microbial DNA in the tumor, you didn't actually have to track down and find a biopsy of the tumor. 
Uh, what it suggested instead was that a blood sample would be sufficient. And so the idea that you could use a liquid biopsy to find an unknown tumour somewhere in the body based on the microbes that would tell you what the tumour location and type were was very exciting and was the basis for that 2020 paper that I showed you uh, a few slides ago. Um, so, uh, so, so on the basis of that work and the basis of a review that was published in Science that I'll say more about later, uh, Greg had what he thought was his final thesis committee meeting to convince his, uh, convince his thesis committee that he was ready to graduate. And uh, one of the members of his committee criticised him for only having had two papers. And he said, well, okay, it's true that I've only published two papers, but one of them is in Nature and the other one is in Science. Shouldn't that count for something? And his committee member said, no, you really need a third paper. And you have already looked at the bacteria. You have already looked at the viruses. Uh, we know that helminths can be associated with cancer, but they are not very important in the US population. Maybe what you should do is you should go after the fungi as well, because there are some reports, especially in pancreatic cancer, that the fungi uh, can be important for, uh, for pancreatic cancer. And Greg was not very happy about that because he felt that he really had enough to graduate by this point. But to placate his committee member, uh, he did an analysis uh, 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 looking at the fungi that were associated with cancer uh, in, in, the same, in the same TCGA resource. But also we were able to team up with Ravid Strassman at the Weissman Institute, who was doing related work uh, that we found out about uh, and teamed up to collaborate. And so this is what led uh, Greg to publish a third paper uh, that came out in Cell, uh, so his committee was happy about that. Um, to uh, look at the landscape of the pan-cancer mycobiome, so looking at the fungi across different cancer types. And this is particularly interesting and relevant because we are increasingly discovering roles for fungi in all kinds of different processes, including cirrhosis, uh, including inflammatory bowel disease, um, and all kinds of other uh, settings where no one had any idea that they were, uh, they were involved. Just like 15 years ago, we had no idea that bacteria were involved in a lot of these processes. And so, uh, as I mentioned, um, this, uh, the, this paper on the pan-cancer mycobiome atlas and the relationship between the, the fungi and the bacteria uh, came out in Cell last year. Uh, one thing that made us very happy is that in the same issue of Cell, uh, Ilyan Eliav's lab at Columbia published a completely independent paper that uh, looked at just two tumour types but was able to replicate many of our findings on the TCGA data as well as extending it to newly collected samples that they, uh, that they collected themselves. And this sort of replication in science we think is very important and very exciting. Uh, if another group finds the same thing that we do, we are not sad about being scooped. We are happy that the results are reproducible and that we can perhaps work together to find the truth more rapidly. Uh, so what we found in this paper was that when you take the fungal and the bacterial information together, uh, it improves cancer type diagnosis performance. And we showed that this was true across multiple different cohorts. So uh, what I'm showing you here is the area under the rock curves on the, um, the y-axis. And in each case, the fungi by themselves gives you, uh, give you the worst classifier performance. Um, the bacteria by themselves do substantially better than the fungi in all three of these graph series. But what is really exciting is that including the fungi always gives you better uh, information than looking at the bacteria by themselves. And we found that this effect was particularly strong for uh, discriminating tumours in blood. And so again, that was particularly exciting because anything that we can do to boost that weak signal in blood uh, for liquid biopsy as opposed to biopsy for a tumour is especially relevant for, for diagnostic performance, especially given the vast, vast uh, biobanks of blood samples around the world uh, that we can potentially go into and look at prospectively for tumour development later. So, um, so, so as, as I mentioned, uh, Greg was obsessed with this idea that the hallmarks of cancer papers have been cited over 100,000 times and don't even mention microbes in cancer. And so one of the proudest moments of my career was last year at the Hallmarks of Cancer Symposium, which they have every year to do updates on, uh, this, uh, on this Hallmarks of Cancer idea. And uh, Greg was able to give a talk uh, about this research and the research that I'm going to show you over the next few slides uh, describing his work uh, on, on the tumour microbiome. And partly as a result of that, uh, he was able to get the microbiome included as a new hallmark of cancer 
in the latest updates to these reviews. So uh, having this thing go from a completely crazy idea that nobody believed three years ago to being something that is presented at the main symposium about this topic in such a remarkably short time um, is just uh, the, kind of, the kind of story that you hardly ever see in science and something that is uh, just incredibly exciting to be able to enable a student to do. So, um, so uh, in one, one thing that we did in the 2020 paper uh, that is, um, that, that is uh, less widely known because it is not the headline message of that, um, uh, of, of that paper, but one thing we looked at there was the Garden360 ctDNA assay, which is based on cell-free DNA and looking for particular mutations in tumours. And one thing that was especially exciting to us is that the information from the microbial DNA is able to pick out the tumour type even when the cell-free DNA does not detect any mutations that are relevant to that particular tumour. And so uh, what is exciting about this is it suggests to us that combining features of the microbial genomes and the human genome together may provide orthogonal uh, sources of information about tumours from a liquid biopsy. And so combining them may be especially important. So uh, as part of the 2020 paper, we did a proof of concept validation of this topic where we did cell-free microbial DNA plasma sequencing in 169 subjects covering three different cancer types. So uh, comparing control individuals to prostate cancer, to lung cancer, and to melanoma. And we also included individuals with HIV as part of that control uh, to assess whether the gut barrier dysfunction that often comes with living with HIV long term itself uh, led to a signal of microbes in the blood that would confound the cancer results. And uh, what we saw in this analysis was uh, that we were able to discriminate the grouped pan-cancer samples against the healthy controls with extremely high accuracy, where the mean uh, area under the rock curve, uh, under a wide range of different, um, different parameter settings, uh, was, was at 0.91, so excellent classifier accuracy. Um, we, uh, we, we also did a proof of concept validation, con uh, um, uh, uh, proof of concept validation, looking at lung cancer specifically, uh, comparing the lung cancer individuals in that cohort from the uh, from the healthy control. And so, uh, what we were looking at there uh, was again using the cell-free microbial DNA in the blood. And you can see that our uh, area under the right curve and area under the precision recall curve were both excellent for that study. And uh, we also, we also uh, performed but did not publish a proof of concept validation suggesting that cell-free microbial DNA uh, can predict melanoma immuno-oncology response. So I think many of you are probably familiar with the studies on uh, Keytruda by many different labs now uh, showing that whether or not you will be a responder or a non-responder to PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint inhibitor therapy depends uh, substantially on your microbiome. And the introduction of microbiome-directed tests as a companion diagnostic for, uh, for uh, melanoma treatment with Keytruda is starting to gain a considerable amount of currency in clinical trials, although it is not yet approved as a diagnostic test. And what we saw in this, uh, in this small pilot, uh, so, so you can see that we're just looking at 18 subjects, but what we saw uh, was that the confusion, uh, sorry, 14 subjects rather, but what you can see is that the confusion matrix um, is strongly weighted towards the diagonal, which essentially means that we can do quite a good job of predicting who will respond and who will not respond from a blood sample rather than a stool sample, which is great because the blood samples are a lot easier to collect in most cohorts. Um, so another really important question uh, that we explored in the 2022 cell paper was looking at how useful the cell-free microbial DNA was compared to human fragmentomics. And fortunately, one of the cohorts that we had access to for this paper uh, was the uh, uh, validation cohort from Johns Hopkins, where they looked at 242 healthy individuals, as well as a whole lot of uh, patients with different kinds of cancer, where uh, they had already published in 2019 uh, the, results of, uh, the results of human fragmentomics on those exact same samples. So, uh, when we, um, so, so what we did was we did a matched microbial analysis on the same samples, uh, essentially looking at the microbial abundance and then using the same types of machine learning uh, that I showed you before to ask how well could we separate out um, the different cancer types from each other and versus healthy individuals based on the microbial DNA and compare it directly to fragmentomics on the same patients with samples collected at the same time. 
And uh, what we saw was that the microbial cell-free DNA outperformed the state-of-the-art human fragmentomic diagnostic uh, analysis. And so uh, again, what you're seeing here are, um, are ROC curves, where the steeper the curve is, the better the diagnostic performance. And on the left-hand side, you're seeing the host fragmentomic analysis from the, uh, from the Hopkins paper in Nature in 2019. And then on the right-hand side, what you're seeing is uh, the same patients, the same samples, but now we are looking only at microbial information where we can get an area under the rock curve of, uh, uh, of uh, 99% uh, using both the bacteria and fungi together. Uh, and using the fungi alone, we get a pretty reasonable rock curve, although not nearly as good as when we use the, fung uh, the fungi and bacteria as a combined classifier. So um, then uh, we, we also wanted to go into the earlier stage cancers. And when we restrict the analysis just to stage one cancers, uh, you, can see, um, you, you can see that we also uh, get excellent classifier performance as long as we include the fungi and the bacteria together. And uh, the fungi provide a substantial improvement over, over looking at the bacteria alone. So this is why uh, we think that including the fungi is going to be very important for diagnostics in a wide range of microbiome applications, where so far uh, mostly the bacteria have been considered because of the ease of doing 16S sequencing uh, compared to looking at other markers. So, um, so uh, Greg, Greg developed all of this into um, a much larger multi-omic machine learning framework uh, using the Codices cohort. And so what is exciting about the Codices cohort is that it is, uh, is matched for age, sex, and risk. And, um, it, uh, and all of the individuals in it are treatment naive. So we know that anything that we are seeing is going to be uh, a result of the disease that they have, not a result of treatment to the disease. And this is a very important point because many different groups now, uh, including, um, uh, including uh, Peter Turnbow's group at uh, UCSF and Pierre Bock's group at EMBL, have shown that for a very large number of drugs, those drugs modify the microbiome, even if, uh, even if they're not thought of as antibiotics or thought of as traditionally targeting the microbiomes. And uh, so when we did a metagenomic analysis of lung cancer versus healthy, uh, what you can see on that principal coordinates plot is a substantial separation between the healthy individuals and the lung cancer individuals, where each dot on this is a, um, is a microbiome uh, using all of the data in the microbial profile, and we're using uh, dimensionality reduction uh, principal coordinates analysis to project it down to two dimensions. In panel A, you can also see a systematic difference in the diversity within each sample. And in panel C, uh, you can see that Pseudomonas specifically seems to be, uh, seems to be implicated here. Um, so then, then the question was how well would the microbial cell-free DNA diagnose early stage lung cancer? And so here what we're doing is looking at all stages and subtypes versus healthy, uh, where you can see that we get excellent uh, classifier performance for a range of different decontamination procedures on the microbial data. And then if we just restrict it to stage one, uh, you can see that if we, um, if we restrict it to stage one, we still get excellent classifier performance. Uh, interestingly, when we subset the codices cohort to only look at smokers, we get even better diagnostic performance. And this is suggesting the potential importance of including phenotype variables uh, as well as looking at uh, microbial variables alone. So, uh, so what this shows is that we can pretty well separate lung cancer versus healthy, but that's not really the clinical question because usually the clinical question that you have is not, can I tell if this person is perfectly healthy or do they have lung cancer? But rather, this person showed up, uh, th this person showed up at my hospital with some kind of respiratory problem. Is their problem lung cancer or is it some other problem with their lung? And so we were also able to use this cohort to look at lung cancer versus lung disease as opposed to looking at lung cancer versus healthy subjects. So uh, again, what you can see is that there's some separation in alpha and beta diversity. And again, you can see Pseudomonas being important in that classifier. Uh, but then, um, but then uh, this is a much more challenging diagnostic, uh, to the diagnostic task, looking at the microbial cell-free DNA if you're looking at lung cancer versus lung disease. Because instead of the near-perfect um, ROC plots that I showed you before, with areas very close to one, um, if we look at all the stages and subtypes on the left-hand side, or if we just look at stage one versus, um, uh, versus uh, healthy on the right-hand side, what you can see is our uh, AUCs are dropping to the 
the 0.75 range, which is still a lot better than chance, but it's not nearly as good as what I was showing you before. And um, again, uh, again, if we, uh, if, if we do this task looking at only smokers, uh, we get better diagnostic performance than if we do it with both smokers and non-smokers. So we really needed to boost the classifier accuracy. And uh, for the cell paper, uh, Greg developed a, uh, a new approach where instead of looking at pre-existing microbial genomes uh, that were derived from all kinds of other sources but not derived from human tumors themselves, uh, what Greg did is develop metagenomic assemblies direct from the TCGA data and from the other clinical cancer data sets that we had access to. And so uh, this gave us the first resource of metagenomes that we made publicly available um, where, uh, where, where those, meta, uh, those metagenome assembled genomes, or MAGs, were assembled directly from the tumors themselves. And we could then map all of the sequences against those tumor-derived microbial genomes instead of relying on a general database of microbial genomes not found in tumors. And uh, we validated this uh, um, across a whole lot of different cancer types, essentially demonstrating that the uh, AUCs were, um, were better when we used the metagenomic bins than when we just used the short read mapping direct in Kraken. Uh, one thing that we found was interesting about this is that when we looked at the microbial data and when we looked at the human fragment data, uh, when we combined the microbial data with the human fragment data together, uh, we got better classifiers. Uh, in other words, um, steeper, uh, uh, steeper curves. So you can see the red curve on the left-hand graph is much steeper uh, with a combined classifier than we get using the microbial bins alone or if we look at the human fragments alone. And again, this speaks to the importance of combining the microbial and human uh, DNA information into, um, into a single system. So um, let's see. Uh, so, so, then, um, so then we went to the codices cohort, and this is unpublished work. Uh, we went to the codices data uh, with 16S ribosomal RNA uh, gene amplicon sequencing out of the plasma, uh, and then looked at inferred functional pathways from that. So basically the question was how well could we predict what functions were going to be in there using only the name tags of the bacteria, like I talked about right at the beginning of the talk, and using statistical techniques to try to project what information there was there. And so uh, what, what you can see here is that the taxonomic and pathway information for lung cancer versus healthy gives decent classifier performance. Uh, for lung cancer versus lung disease, it's considerably harder. So we do, better, but, uh, we do better than chance, but we don't have the sort of thing that we would go to the FDA and tell them we have a diagnostic. But then when we include metadata, so we include several fields of clinical data and protein markers, uh, what we get there is we get excellent classifiers again, separating out lung cancer from lung disease, not lung cancer versus healthy, which is an easier classification task. And so uh, this is the basis of the Oncobiota product uh, that I mentioned that Micronoma has uh, received FDA breakthrough designation of and uh, where we are currently, uh, we're currently uh, trying to get that published in a uh, peer review journal. Uh, so the major lessons and takeaways from all of this, uh, first off that metagenomics enhances early stage lung cancer detection um, in both low risk and high risk clinical settings. Um, the second is that you really have to have risk, age, and sex match cases and controls like in the codices cohort, and these are critical for estimating the real world diagnostic performance where uh, instead of comparing cancer versus healthy, you're trying to uh, diagnose cancer versus other reasons why people present with, with comparable problems in the same organ system. And uh, we also derived the first, to our knowledge, de novo cancer-associated metagenomes, which provide much better bio biomarkers than existing microbial genomes do. So, um, so what is the future of all of this going to be? Well, uh, I've, been uh, I've been inspired for a long time by uh, this quote from Alan Kay, uh, who was one of the developers of the graphical user interface that you use on every camera, uh, sorry, every, uh, every computer, uh, every phone that you have access to now, where, uh, where, where he's uh, widely quoted as saying that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And we have quite a lot of invention to go on this, but uh, we think there is a tremendous potential for the microbiome to play a key role, not just in diagnosis, but in all stages of the cancer life cycle, including prognosis, especially with, uh, especially with companion diagnostics for drugs like, uh, uh, like uh, immuno-oncology drugs, uh, with therapy, 
Um, and then finally, uh, then, then with remission and tracking remission by the absence of tumor markers and that cell-free DNA in the blood, and then uh, on an ongoing basis tracking for recurrence. And if we can do this from a blood sample rather than needing a, uh, needing a biopsy of tissue or needing a stool sample, it's dramatically easier for patients and dramatically easier for clinicians. So uh, getting these additional pieces of technology in place uh, is, really, um, is, is really what's inspiring our vision of how the microbiome can play a role in all stages of, uh, of, of cancer care. And uh, I should note that microbiome-directed cancer, cancer interventions are already saving lives. So I want to highlight some work that, um, uh, that, that I wasn't involved in from Jen Wago's lab at MD Anderson and her many collaborators, where, um, uh, where, where I mentioned earlier on that from a stool sample, you can stratify people pretty well as a responder or a non-responder for Keytruda. So basically, you can run this microbiome test on their stool and tell are they in the one-third of patients that Keytruda works remarkably well well for melanoma on, or are they in the two-thirds where it does not work very well? And so Jen had the uh, amazing additional idea of taking it one step further and asking, suppose I have a patient and I do this microbiome test on their gut microbiome and I find out they are not going to respond to Keytruda. Could I modify their microbiome with a dietary therapy so that they will respond to Keytruda and live instead of die? And so the particular uh, aspects of diet that she thought she would look at are pretty obvious ones, right? Fiber and probiotics, which there's a tremendous amount of consumer enthusiasm for, as well as quite a lot of peer-reviewed data in particular clinical settings. So, uh, what, uh, so what she found in the study was that fiber does indeed prolong life and reshape your microbiome so you will be a key treater responder. But probiotics don't. And what she found is that the patients on probiotics actually died faster than the patients not on probiotics. And what's more, she could reproduce this in an animal model where she started with germ-free mice with absolutely no microbes of their own and then gave them uh, the microbiome of an individual patient and the tumor cells from that patient and then either gave them probiotics or withheld the probiotics. And what she found is that with either of two commercially available probiotics, the tumors in the mice grew larger, and also the mice died faster if they had the probiotics. And so this is a really important cautionary note about probiotics. Just because you try it out in a healthy population does not mean that it will improve the health of people who are sick, and you have to do the clinical trials in the relevant populations. And uh, the fact that this is important and difficult is reinforced by a couple of papers from Aran Segal's lab, where uh, in the first one, and these were published in 2018 back to back in Cell, uh, but um, are not as widely known as I would like them to be. In the first one, what they showed is that just like colonization resistance is a thing for pathogens, as we found during the COVID pandemic, where even with COVID-19, most people who were exposed to it didn't get sick. Um, what, uh, you see that with probiotics, where most people exposed to a given probiotic, it will not establish in their gut. And uh, they also demonstrated that probiotics harm your response, your recovery after antibiotics uh, to getting your normal microbiome back. And what works a lot better is to save a sample of your stool and give it back to yourself after the antibiotics. Although in the US at least, stool is regulated as a drug and you are not allowed to do this unless it's in the uh, context of a research study. But there are some very promising technologies that are more counterintuitive than the idea that you should just take probiotics. And I'll, I'll just very briefly uh, mention one that we're working on with, um, uh, with a close friend and colleague at UC San Diego, uh, Amir Zarenpar, in our uh, GI division, where uh, this is in our paper in Cell last year, where what we're looking at is the strategy of engineering native bacteria to get around some of those problems with probiotics. And uh, this is a lot like CAR T cell therapy, except it's for microbes instead of for T cells. So the idea is that you take microbes out of a host, so you know for sure that that microbe can already colonize that host. And then you're going to modify it. So in this, in this case, what we're doing is we're adding biosalt hydrolases, which is something that E. coli normally can't produce. And then the idea is that you give it back to the host and see whether it modifies metabolism. And so what you're seeing here is that the pink, uh, the pink dots, which are our modified bacteria, always have very different levels of what we're measuring uh, compared, to the, uh, compared to the blue and the green controls. And uh, you'll see more of that soon. 
So what's really exciting about this approach is that we can achieve precision modification of the metabolome. Uh, so what you can see here is that the, uh, the pink dots are always in a different location, high or low, versus the controls, showing a completely different primary and secondary bile acid profile with the addition of this bile salt hydrolase to native E. coli, but it does not work at all if you instead use a lab strain of E. coli and try to colonize the mice with it. But what was really cool about the study is that we showed that it impacted the metabolome but left the microbiome completely alone. So you can see no significant difference in any, um, in, in any of those three bars, the two kinds of control versus the engineered bacteria. And so this gives us a very precise way of modifying metabolic char characteristics of the microbiome, but not touching the microbiome itself. Uh, I also want to very briefly highlight the Cheetah portal for the cancer microbiome. Uh, so Cheetah is our web, uh, our web application that basically takes uh, the data from literally hundreds of thousands of microbiome samples contributed by the scientific community and uh, makes it available as well as uh, analysis frameworks and the ability to share your analysis with other community members. And we are specifically funded by the uh, US National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute uh, to maintain this, uh, this particular portal for cancer to make it easy to compare your cancer microbiome studies to other cancer microbiome studies using standardized techniques. And so uh, I, I would invite all of you um, to contact me about working together to study these microbe cancer links and together benefit patients if it is the direction that you're interested in. Uh, so with that, um, I would uh, once again, uh, I would once again like to thank Chairman Lee, uh, Professor Lee, the organizers of this wonderful symposium, and uh, all of the other speakers and uh, all of you for coming along to it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the amazing team at Micronoma who, who, uh, who have been working specifically on these cancer diagnostics. Uh, the numerous members of my lab who it's a true delight to come in and work with every day at UC San Diego. Uh, literally over a thousand collaborators, so I'm sorry if I didn't mention you and you're watching this uh, uh, in the audience or on a recording right now. Uh, and our many sources of funding, including uh, the tens of thousands of members of the public, have contributed to our citizen science efforts. <laughs> Uh, and with that, um, thanks again for having me. Uh, uh, here's some pointers to some additional resources, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have. Thank you.